Hello everyone, Germ here, and welcome back to Mentally Diseased, where we talk about experiences with the Jehovah's Witnesses and try to dispel some common misconceptions about so-called mentally diseased apostates. Today, I'm very excited to be chatting with Sean Smith. He was the very model of how Watchtower tells gay people to deal with their sexuality. Pray it away. Just don't do it. Go pioneer. Go serve in Bethel. He did all of these things, served in Bethel for six years, even found himself a wife, and had a son. Here to talk to me today about how all of that went for him is Sean. Sean, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm pretty good. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm so excited to be chatting with you. We've been corresponding over email for a while now, um, and you've got one humdinger of a story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's a really important story, though, and it'll help a lot of people because you really did do the whole thing that you're supposed to do. You did it all. Yeah, yeah pretty much. <laughs> yeah. It's a roller, co roller coaster, so um, strap in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you've actually been out of the witnesses now for close to 20 years. Is that right? A little over 20 years. Yeah, I've been here in Seattle for, uh, we're going on 20 years this year, and uh, I was kicked out about three or four years before that. So it's going on probably 25 or so. So time flies. Wow. Huh? Wow. Time does really fly. So why yeah. didn't you, why are you just dealing with this now, just telling your story now? What prompted you to fall down the rabbit hole as you've just hmm. done? Yeah, well, as a lot of witnesses and as I did, uh, when my life fell apart, I pretty much put it in a box, locked it with the key, put that key on the shelf and promised myself never to look at it. And, um, and that was um, all in well until a few months ago, I was watching on uh, Twitter. We watch on YouTube, uh, a movie critic on YouTube, Chris Stuckman, and he made some comment about his story about coming out as an extra of witness. I turned to my partner, Craig, my husband, now Craig, I was like, can you believe it? He was a Jehovah's Witness. What? Chris Duckman of all people? And so I watched his interview and that inadvertently led me down the rabbit hole of looking at different stories on YouTube. And I was able to see there's a lot of content. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, <laughs> including yourself. I had honestly no no idea you know as a witness you're ingrained not to even look that way right you you know it's 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 weird to explain to people it's weird to tell people that you aren't even supposed to even look about look at anything that talks bad about the jehovah's witnesses and even when you're not one yourself after years it's 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 still it follows you. you yeah Yeah, it's like this little programming that you can't quite get it's like it's like in those movies where uh, they're under mind control and they have to go and take this implant you know out of the back <laughs> of your head and then the, you can see the light and so and it's partly that and it's also partly um i didn't want to uh, jeopardize uh, my son as you mentioned i have a son and we'll get into that a little bit more but i uh i didn't want to speak or cause any rift to jeopardize him and his well-being and as well as my own personal trauma i didn't want to experience it again and so i saw him on youtube and um and then i saw you as well as a couple others and uh, your story about how you came out uh, as a as a gay Jehovah's ex Jehovah's Witness really touched me. I saw that you were in uh, Colorado at one point. One point. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And just around the corner from where I'm at, in Nebraska. Yeah, I actually lived in Kansas uh, for a while too, so even closer. Oh yeah, yeah. where at? Yeah, uh, I was in Goodland, Kansas, so exactly. right on the Colorado border there. But that's mostly where I lived. Was like you know rural. Mm -hmm. rural areas there so yes. while, while we're going back there let's talk a little bit about your life as a jehovah's witness because the impression i got from your emails and everything was that you actually enjoyed the life for the most part you weren't an unhappy witness at all mm -hmm. so talk us through like what your family life was like and what your experience as a jehovah's witness was well my family life is a little complicated because my dad was 
very strict. It was mm -hmm. a very dictator like rule of my dad. You don't um, you don't misbehave at the meetings, at restaurants. I'm one of five boys and we would walk into the congregation or any congregation and people would look our way and see all five of us stepping in line, not misbehaving, even the twins, which is un it's really hard to do with that many boys. <laughs> yeah. But my dad was strict. He definitely did not spare the rod, so to speak. Mm -hmm. He uh, was quick to punishment. And I uh, received a lot of that punishment growing up and learned early on to really step in line and really to watch my P's and Q's. And I learned how to become the exemplary model, perfect Christian. And I uh, did it more and more to stay out of trouble. But then mm -hmm. as I started growing up in the religion, I started auxiliary pioneering as I um, became in my, uh, uh, my teens. And, um, I liked it. I was good at it. I was good at talking. I was good at talking to people. And uh, I uh, also, more more good I did, the less trouble I got in. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I can but, relate to that. I had a very similar situation with my father, and it felt uh, – it. I, I felt the same way. The only way to escape the wrath um, was to be a, as good of a witness as I could, you know, make him proud mm -hmm. because me being good made him look good. Is that kind of how it was in your family? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, every one of us, my mom, all five of us, all of us had to, like I said, step in line and do what's expected of us. We went to all the meetings. He was an elder and a very influential elder. He, uh, um, early on in uh, my youth, I uh, started a hearing aid center, and uh, he employed a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses throughout Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, Iowa, Missouri. So there were lots of witnesses that were under the pyramid, so to speak, the tree of my dad. And so uh, he was very influential in uh, a lot of decisions. He gave talks at circuit assemblies. I was in plenty of skits. <laughs> I was in plenty <laughs> of uh, circuit assembly and a few district assembly skits and um, volunteering at the assemblies. And that's where I started making friends with other witnesses. And I was very eager. I was a very hyper outgoing kid. So I was eager to volunteer for anything that I could. So I was doing anything from passing the mics at church to uh, setting up AV to uh, volunteering for the food at the assemblies. And it just grew from there. So, and then I, uh, I learned as long as I did what was right, I was praised. And of course, as any a good Jehovah's Witness or any human likes praise, just yeah. uh, any, any animal will tell you, just tell your dog, give, give your dog a treat and he'll come back for more treats. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, um, uh, praise and um, um, brainwashing 101. You, you yeah. give them praise and you tell them not what to do and you tell them not to look outside the sphere. You can't think on your own. Um, but at any rate, to answer your question, yes, um, I was the perfect witness. I exactly pioneered after I got baptized uh, during my, uh, my teenage years. And uh, the circuit overseers and district overseers would stay at our place. My dad had a place where they would stay. So we were always in the know, or my dad was, of all the powerful elders and uh, the circuit overseers in the area. Uh, I remember at a young age, I was probably 14 or 15. My dad was also a pilot. He had a little plane. Him and a couple other elders were in this club where they owned a plane. And they would, it, it, it's the top of the top, I'm telling you, the crest. Wow. It's not, it's, I can't even describe how much influence they had. And um, we flew to New York City. It was probably a eight hour flight in this little Cessna, little one, <laughs> one uh, uh, engine plane, uh, three of us boys in the back and my dad and a friend flew to uh, New York City. And I still have memories of us going to Fred Franz's uh, office there at uh, Columbia Heights, there at the Watchtower. Really? Uh, yeah, and my dad uh, fit Franz with uh, hearing aids. So he gave, of course- No free kidding. <laughs> yeah. So my dad uh, fit him with the best hearing aids that is possible, you know, the, the <laughs> top of the line, um, miracle ear, and it does all this. And and I, I remember being like, just enthralled with, 
with with Bethel and, and Franz and his knowledge. First to us, the way they talked about him, he was like a god. You know, right. it was like meeting God himself. You can imagine, you know, going in Fred's office in his library and, and he told me, go over four books over. He was about he's blind at the time and he had things memorized. He said, go four or five books over, go down, look at page 632 down here and read this one thing. Of course, my mind's blown just because of right. uh, something that just takes a basic memory skill. But um, I mean, not to knock Fred, I'm sure he was very, uh, he was a genius in his own right. Um, but I had memories of, 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 of that trip. It was very poignant visiting Bethel. And um, then flying back to New York, and then as soon as I was 19, I applied with the Circuit of here. Three months later, I was accepted, and in August of uh, 1990, I uh, flew into New York City and Brooklyn. It's the happiest day of my life. Uh, not only to just go to Bethel, but to get away from Dad. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Well, and there's also that because you grew up in a small town, right? Oh, yes, in Cook, yeah. Nebraska. Very small. Yeah. And there's that kind of whole thing when you grow up in a small town, because I also grew up in small towns. It's like you, you, you view the city as like your ultimate destination. Like you're almost like Luke Skywalker in the first Star Wars movie, like looking off at the double suns, you know, I'm going to be there someday. That's going to be me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, to do all of that and it yeah. Bethel. It was. Like you said, the, the city on the shining hill, it really was to me. And I, I was, my DNA was perfect for it because I'm a very fast paced, hyper kid. I, I knew structure for my dad. He ran our family like a, like a military. And, you know, when dad came home from work, um, you know, I still embedded in my mind. As soon as you hear the garage door shut. All five of us would stop what we're doing to flee, including my mom. And we all had to be doing something, working, studying. Uh, we, TV went off. He would every single day of my life growing up. Uh, when we came home, we could not be playing. And not until the years later, I, I was at someone else's house and their dad came home uh, from work and the kids didn't do anything. They're still watching TV or playing big games. I'm like, why don't you want to turn that off? Your dad's here. <laughs> no, he came in. He said like, he greeted them, and they said I was foreign to me. I couldn't believe it. I was like, "There's actually families that do this, that had yeah. a normal family life." But yeah, every single day of my life, I was scared to death at 5 p.m. or so. Uh, as soon as we hear the garage door close, we would all run in five, six different directions, including my mom. She'd start cleaning and get uh, dinner ready. I would immediately grab a broom and start start. Sweeping, there was nothing to sweep because we swept, we repainted the house three times a year just because to keep us busy. Uh, we mowed everyone's lawns the entire block. Um, so I'm sure our neighbors loved us. But um, when when your dad got home, what did he do? Oh, yeah. He immediately went downstairs to his lazy chair. And if there's any sound, if we made any noise, sound whatsoever, he, he was known for his high pitched whistle. I can't even do it. Uh, it was the whistle of terror. Uh, we would, if anything was wrong, if we played, if it was too loud, we'd get a spanking. And yeah. uh, we'd get beat with whatever was close by, whether it was a board, a belt, a hanger, uh, you name it. It was, uh, it was, it was terrifying. It was very rare that I ever see my dad be kind, um, except when he was around other people. The, the people of the congregation loved him. The people, the, the, the flock, they looked up to dad. And so they thought he was the greatest thing ever, especially when he took them out on, on boating trips or to go skiing or up in the plane or with the, uh, with the other elders playing basketball. He played basketball. With these, he had a club that they'd play with every week. They'd go North Platte and go, go play basketball together. It was the, the, you know, the elite elders club. Yeah. And then the, the wives would be in the back talking. I can't, I can't express to you enough how much I can relate. Like you could just, it was like you copy paste <laughs> your, your life onto mine. I think we might've had the same dad there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. Not terrible. I, I laugh not but because it's funny. It's because I can relate so much to it. And it's just crazy to me how much before we get into like the Bethel stuff and all of that, I kind of want to ask like at, 
because you, you, during your teenage years, obviously somewhere in there, you realize that you're gay. When did that realization come to you? And what was that like for you living in a small town as a Jehovah's Witness with that kind of father? <laughs> well, that's complicated. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't really realize I was gay, probably until New York. But I knew I had this inkling. I still remember the first time I was exposed to something gay-like. I was, uh, uh, I, uh, me and some friends went to a um, convenience store, small convenience store called Casey's. There in uh, in McCook, and in the back area was a section of, of books in these um, non-see-through plastic casings, like Playboy's and Penthouse. Remember, you know them. And one of my friends. Schoolmates, I shouldn't say friends. You're not supposed to associate with the world, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. You're a schoolmate. There were a couple yes. of kids that I, well, they're in my same neighborhood. That we would hang out, hang around a little bit, you know, when dad wasn't around, or they can watch all five of us at all times. But uh, when uh, we're at Casey's, he stole one of those penthouses, or I can't remember what it was, a, a girly magazine. Um, in the back of the magazine, there was a one tiny little ad that had a picture of two guys kissing because that was the first time i'd seen something like that first my mind just was like drawn to that immediately it was like a scope right in on that advertisement it's very subtle and it said uh, uh mail in 10 bucks here to get gay porn and i was like I, I had to do this. So I secretly, I just, I couldn't contain it myself. I was probably 15 or 16 and I it was the dumbest thing. I could have gotten so much on how I didn't. You I mean, did it. So I, I mailed it and I only had my one mailbox, you know, there, um, there in McCook. So I mailed in to this little thing and I got this and I, just, I ran home from school every single day to try to kept it, to check Get the, the mail, mail first. Yeah. <laughs> and I ran home every day, every day, every day. And then finally, one day I went there and there was a nondescript envelope with my name on it. First, my heart just about went out of my chest. And I went somewhere private, opened up, and it was this little uh, pamphlet of all of these sexual positions. You know, this basic small pamphlet showing all these different uh, um, depictions of gay sex. My mind was just, I was, you know, that's when I started really discovering masturbation I wasn't supposed to <laughs> and um and uh I couldn't I couldn't believe it so I cherished that there's probably like 10 little like pictures I cherish those 10 pictures Isn't that crazy and I would hide those somewhere in the my gym bag and uh one day uh, months later somehow my mom went to my gym bag and found those pictures <gasps> I was horrified uh -huh. She's a very um, meek, soft-spoken woman. You know, unless, until, unless you cross her, then she can uh, get mad. But um, I, she put up with a lot with my dad having to raise all of us. So I really feel for my mom. Uh, she did go through quite a bit uh, raising us and trying to really do what she felt was right. So she uh, came to me instead. She came to me in my room. She was like, what are these? What, what's going on? Immediately I lied. I was like, I don't know. I started crying. A friend of mine at school um, stuck these in my locker and I didn't know what to do. And I just put them in my in my uh, gym bag and I didn't want to say anything. I didn't know where to put them. And, and um, I don't know if she bought the lie or not, but she, that was the end of it. I, you know, she threw, we threw them away and that was all we heard of that. <laughs> And uh, she didn't tell my dad, thankfully. Wow. And yeah, so I had this inkling that I was gay, but I didn't really want to be gay. I thought was wrong. You know, I was told it was wrong. It's against the Bible. It's, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, you know, yes. it, it's, it's, it's in a very that, different time too. What, what decade was this? It was, uh, well, I went to Bethel in 1990. So it was a uh, late eighties, 80. It was probably 87 or 88 or something like right. that. So that, kind of in the middle of the AIDS crisis on top of that, you know, it was yeah. a very different world for gay people back then yeah. than it is now. Yeah, which as witnesses, we live in a very small kaleidoscope. We don't you know, look outside of our parameters, of, mm -hmm. uh, our, our religion, our, our life. You don't know what's going on in uh, social, real economical events in the world. It's, right. They're just right. blind to it. Um, 
So at any rate, I uh, didn't really start to express my gay self until I went to Bethel. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's is... talk about Bethel. So you arrived there. Uh, yeah. To, Tell us all about it. Everyone okay. loves a good Bethel story. Let's hear it. Spill the tea. Okay. So uh, <laughs> first off, I was so excited to be at Bethel. I was so excited. I was so happy. I, like I said, it was your perfect Bethelite. It was fast paced. I love the structure. I love, you know, getting up in the mornings were kind of hard, but I, I did it. I was first at work, last to leave. I even exerted pioneered at my church my church my congregation there in uh, north about north bronx uh which is like an hour away so all the time that we spent commuting to the bronx and back three times a week and on top of the other times i went there to go hang out with friends or go out in service so i worked in the laundry department there at bethel i started there in the laundry the laundry was located under the tower building in the 124 columbia heights building in the tunnels area uh, which was super hot, and it was really deplorable conditions to work in. But, you know, we, we, we were just happy to be at Bethel. We didn't care. We were so, all the people I worked around, the brothers and sisters worked very hard. I remember witnessing a sister pass out because it was so hot and spraying one of the, the hot press machines from the laundry. And they gave her some water. She got back up and went back to work, you know, 10 minutes later. And I was, of course, impressed by her, you know, yeah. by her resolve. I wanted to be like that, you know, be able to um, keep going no matter what. That's what they ingrain on you. And I did. I went through some stuff and I wanted to be the best worker and the fastest laundry person ever. And I loved it. And I loved my coworkers. I wouldn't say love. I, I, I got along with everyone. I made friends with everybody that I was around. And uh, the laundry was moved from the towers to the 360 Furman building about a year or two later, and uh, much better conditions there. Um, but I worked there at the laundry, and um, and as I was there for my years at Bethel, I would uh, brush shoulders with uh, some of the you know governing body. Of course, they were there, you know, some of the higher ups. Um, one of uh, the people I became um, friends with was Garrett and Mar Marie de La Loche. Uh, he uh, was just a couple of doors down from my apartment there at the Bossert Hotel. Wow. Yeah. And then Marie de, she was also a housekeeper, so she worked the laundry once a week. So we would talk all the time and, uh, and work together. And uh, lovely woman. Uh, Garrett was a very nice person to me. He was very fine. And um, one fond memory I have there, because I like, I uh, played piano. Ma Mom and dad made me uh, learn how to play piano, which I'm very grateful for, oh, cool. for the years. And one of my favorite things I would do at Bethel is play piano in the lobbies on my time off. I would go to the tower lobby or the 124 lobby or the bosser and just play all the kingdom songs. I remember being at the Tower Hotel and looking back and I heard someone um, singing behind me. It was Carl Klein. <laughs> he wrote some of those songs. You know, yeah. He was, yeah. So it was really just amazing. So he was there hanging out with me for hours singing the kingdom songs right behind me as I'm playing the piano with Carl Klein there uh, at my shoulder. That was pretty cool. So uh, that was- What was your favorite kingdom song? Ah, oh, of course you would ask me my favorite. I can't even remember it. Was it's the favorite? Isn't the one that everyone likes? It's not life everlasting. Uh, it's not that one. It was a very dramatic piece. Uh, they talked about revelation. What was it? Um, I'll I'll put it. I'll I'll, I'll let you know when I find uh, the, remember. The firm and determined, and this time of it was it that one. No, but I like that one too. Yeah, I played them all. Um, I like it was that <laughs> it was the one that had the minor um, keys and um, and it talked about tribulation and 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 it was just very very powerful. And I was able to I was able to embellish the songs and make them even more powerful. That was my oh, that was more did they, they let you do that? They, yeah, they, absolutely. Oh, Carl loved it when I yeah. Really? That's yeah. very interesting because I remember a lot of people would try to embellish in like my congregations or they try to like put a different spin on it. And it mm -hmm. was like, you almost got disfellowshipped over it. And oh, it no, I, I was good. Wow. 
Uh, I was already the model citizen, so whenever I whatever I did, it was perfect. <laughs> yeah, so, of course, yes. Yeah, I, 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 people, I was the type of Beth Light that people hated because I was so gung ho. I loved it. Uh, people look at me and roll their eyes at me because I was so devout. I, uh, I, I thrived. Like I said, just after with my upbringing, my dad and being at Bethel, I thrived there. And if it wasn't because we weren't accepted to Bethel, me and my ex-wife may very well be there to this day. Um, that was one of the saddest days of my life. I still remember driving across the George Washington Bridge and looking in the river mirror crying. I was bawling. I did not want to leave New York. I was so sad. It was a New York meant so much to me in, in two different ways. I was living a double life. I had my Jehovah's Witness, Bethel, and then my other life that I would dip into once in a while, the gay life. Well, let's, that, yeah, let's talk about that because that a lot of people see, especially ex-witnesses, they have this like idea of Bethel in their head as like the gay mecca of Jehovah's Witnesses. It's where all the gay people go and everybody's humping their pillows. And, you know, there's lots of like tawdry massages happening. Is that is that the way it was? Well, thing is, while I was at Bethel, I didn't do anything with other Bethelites. That's the thing. I kept the two worlds separate completely. I was the perfect Bethelite, but I was couldn't deny this part of me. It was like being gay is like, and trying to hide it, it's like caging a beast. Mm -hmm. You're caging this animal inside you. And that's what I tried to do for years. I hated myself because of it. I hated it. I, I, I hated the thoughts. It made me depressed. It made me upset. And I've said many times that if I could have just cut my left arm off and that was the gay part of me and I could go on with my uh, happy Bethel life, I would have done it in a heartbeat if I knew that would have made the gay go away. But that gene can't just be cut out of you. I had taken a long time to realize that. Um, and uh, so my first experience, um, we were... Uh, Driving, I remember driving my uh, congregation group, the elders, to uh, we carpool to the Bronx. We uh, were headed to the Bronx, and there was some road construction there um, uh, there on the highway. So they had to go through Manhattan, Lower Manhattan. And I remember seeing a billboard that depicted a, it was a gay ad, gay people. Of course, right away, my my mind went to that, and I cataloged that. Okay, where is this at? What street is this? You know, where am I at? <laughs> and so a month or so later, I, I never could get that image out of my head. When I had my first Saturday to myself, Saturday off, I strapped on my rollerblades. I put my jean oh, shorts on. How nice. Oh, yeah. Love it. I, I, sh I should send you the picture. Um, <laughs> put my rayon shirt on, which I was known for. I, I know. How did they not know, not know I was gay? I know. <laughs> and I took off across the Brooklyn Bridge over in that direction. That's all I knew, towards the Twin Towers, towards uh, uh, Lower Manhattan. And I just weaved up and down Lower Manhattan, found myself in the Greenwich Village. Of course, my heart's beating out of my chest when I'm seeing more people holding hands that are of the same sex. I couldn't believe it. And I meandered through Bleecker Street and Christopher Street and found my way over to the West Side Highway. And there was this pier, and I saw all these guys kind of just checking each other out, like walking by each other and walking through. There's this chain fence with this big hole in it and all of this rubble, and they're walking through the hole of this fence to go onto this dilapidated pier. So I couldn't help myself but slowly slink over there. And here I am, this skinny little blonde boy, you can imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone's looking at me like I'm blood in the water of sharks. And uh, I make my way through the hole as I, with my rollerblades <laughs> onto the pier. <laughs> it probably was a sight, I can't imagine. Yeah. And made my way to the end of that pier and sat there and scared to death, but nervous and excited. And someone sat next to me, some uh, Latino boy. And, um, we had our I had my first gay experience in the open, right there on the piers, on the West Side Highway in the open sky, looking at New Jersey and planes going by and the boats going. It was, and of course there was we had, we had an audience. I didn't, remember, but it was 
it was one of the most liberating and exciting and fun things of my life being able to do that it felt like it was my real self it was yeah. you know coming out so that was my first experience out in the open that was crazy that was a wild first I know. experience my friend what wow. first experience on the piers of new york out in the open wow and i made my way we exchanged numbers and um i felt bad about it and i i really felt guilty and i tried to stop and i prayed and prayed and tried to study harder try to do more things try to be more more diligent at at, at bethel and i would still want to explore that gay side so i would secretly on my days off and uh, here and there go and meet up with that guy uh or go to central park i found myself going to central park a few times places i shouldn't have been uh back then it wasn't as nice as it is now <laughs> yeah there some uh, dangerous parts and i probably put myself in some dangerous situations but it's funny funny when you you're trying to put your leash on that gay beast and it starts to claw its way out that you can't control it and the more you try to leash it the more angry it gets absolutely it's like until it comes out in a way that you can't control yeah it's it's crazy but yeah that uh that was my first experience there at bethel uh, and I had a few other experiences. There was this one in, uh, there was this one time I brought a boy to Bethel even. Oh my goodness. You brought a boy into God's house. Mm -hmm. I'd been there for a while now. I started to get more and more bold as we all do with things. Uh -huh. I started to get more and more bold and, uh, I met this guy down by the, uh, in this they had these nondescript xxx um movie places uh, movie right. cinemas yeah and it's not really there's no real signage outside so they keep it pretty secret but somehow somehow i found it <laughs> and uh went in there you pay five bucks to go in there to the theater and sit and watch it a gay porno and people can sit next to you and you can just sit there by yourself or you can sit next to someone and and have a uh, a helper and uh so i met this uh college student who was going to college there in uh new york university and we started kissing and going at it and we wanted a good place to go we he couldn't take me to his dorm and i was like oh, i i knew my roommate was gone it's like maybe if i can just bring him to my room for a few hours so he took the subway over to brooklyn heights and I got off of there at Montague Street. That's where, uh, that's by where the Bosser Hotel is, just down the streets where, uh, um, where I was staying. And uh, by then, I'd know, I'd known quite a few people. I knew people at the front desk. They'd seen me. I played the lobbies all the time with the, the piano, so everyone know, knew me at the lobbies. And um, so I thought, well, I'll just say he's my Bible study. He even had like a streak of purple hair. I don't, I can't believe I. I thought I could get away with it, which I did. So I walked in and they, you know, I have to check your IDs. I was like, hey, how's it going, Jeff? He's like, yeah, you did. we're just going up for a little Bible study. Oh, okay. Have a good day. And up we went to the elevator to my room and I had a couple hours of gay ecstasy. At oh my gosh. Garrett Loesch could never, if he knew. <laughs> I know. I know. How it's, scared were you? I, at the time, I was just excited. I was, uh, af afterwards, it's funny, the guilt and the fear comes later when you're trying to get them out. You yeah. Know, you know how it is. You're just trying try to clean things yeah. up, get them out, got the sheets. I knew where to put the laundry since I worked in the laundry <laughs> and uh, put it down the laundry <laughs> chute and I uh, could get more sheets. Uh, so I knew how to do that. And, um, and then off he went and, uh, no one's the wow. wiser. Yeah, yeah now, there's, now there's some random guy out there right now who has this crazy story he tells all of his friends about how he had a gay hookup in the Jehovah's Witness compound. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. I went to some some cult there, yeah. And probably nobody believes him, but here's confirmation, <laughs> everybody. It's a true story. Exactly. But yeah, throughout the years at Bethel, I did a lot of pretty amazing devote things. Um, I, I was assigned a uh, assignment to help one of the governing body when he was later in his age, um, Carrie, uh, not Carrie, John Booth, John C. Booth. 
uh, was getting up there in age. So I took shifts taking care of him when uh, when uh, in the evening. So I would go and watch him for uh, a night here and there and help take care of him. So I, of course, that was a privilege being around John Booth. And then uh, I met uh, Carrie Barber. I remember uh, there was this place in New Jersey where you can go camping, which was campsite. And it was right right outside of their uh, their farm there in New Jersey. So I would have to put a requisition in to make this camp, uh, to, uh, to reserve a time on this campsite. So I did the requisition. I took a bunch of my witness friends there. It was a fun time. We they had a little lake, I swim in the lake. And then one morning there, Saturday morning, Carrie Barber and his wife was there and he had his watch. He dropped his watch in the, um, in the, in the lake right there on the, on the, on the dock. He's like, oh, my watch. Oh, no. And, of course, I dived right in down to the bottom of the lake to get Carrie Barber's watch. And, uh, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, I was, yeah, every, every time I turned around, I was, you know, um, rubbing shoulders with someone there. Wow. It was, it was an exciting time of my life. And, like I said, I would still have been there if they didn't accept me and my wife to get uh, my ex-wife to get accepted there in the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses because yeah. As yeah. So you mentioned that earlier, your ex-wife. So how did this all? How did you meet a wife? What made you? I'm <laughs> doing all of these gay flings, and suddenly you have a wife. Let's let's uh, cover the cover the ground there. What happened? So again, I'm trying to suppress this gay beast. Uh -huh. That's why I kept calling it this beast in a cage. I'm trying to cage it. I'm trying to, and he would break out of one cage. I put it into another cage. Mm -hmm. And I could try to cage it, and I think I've gotten it. Maybe if I get married, a lot of my friends were starting to get married. I was moving up. I was Miss Joe's servant, giving talks at the meetings. I was a trainer at the laundry, and uh, one of the managers there. So it was exciting times for me. I was doing everything I was supposed to, and uh, some of my friends were getting married, and some that had been there less than me, bringing their wives in. So I thought, well. Maybe if I see someone that I like, and I met this girl in Omaha, Nebraska, at one of our district assemblies when we went back to Nebraska. And of course, uh, we started hanging out and she was a lovely woman. I uh, fell in love with her. And I adored her completely. And um, I proposed to her in a movie type pro proposition, by the way. I, oh. <laughs> if, 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 if anyone knows me, I don't do anything little. So no. I, uh, I uh, it may be part of it's compensating. I don't know. So at the 360 building, the, I had access to the roof. I'd always go to the roof during my uh, breaks at lunch to, 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 to lay out to get a tan. I was always tanning up there with my friends. Um, so I got these big cardboard, you know, big pieces of paper, basically, big pieces of cardboard where you can draw each letter, W-I-L-L, -L, will you marry me, you know, on it. And so I took uh, Angela over to the pier on the other side of uh, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge. It's one of the main piers that, um, that the helicopters come and go. It's a helicopter pad. And I uh, got a helicopter. So I took her up in a helicopter and oh had him do a couple passes. I gave him an extra 20 bucks. I was like, can you go over the 360 building? I'm trying to propose to my girlfriend. And uh, so he did a couple passes over the 360 building. And I'm like, look, look. And she looked and there said, will you marry me, Angela? In letters right across the top of the 360 Furman building. And I gave her my grandma's ring that she gave me an emerald, um, a beautiful ring and proposed to her right there in the helicopter. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know. And then we landed. And we got a town car. And I took her to the tavern on the green there in Central Park. So it's a perfect, like, you know, movie proposal. Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, how can I be gay? Right. And I, I did it perfect. <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing that can be said about the gays, though. We don't half ass anything like that. No, no, no. <laughs> when I'm given a task, we do it. So, I applied to stay at Bethel. And I was heartbroken, heartbroken when they denied my claim. I, both of us, she would have made a good Bethelite too. She's a very hard worker. She's very loyal there in the religion. And we would have been your, again, model couple there at Bethel. And we may, may, may be there still. And I would be denied my true self to this day. 
Can you can you explain a little bit for anybody that's not familiar with the process what what you mean by claim and how, why you were denied? Yeah, well, so you have to put your application in and actually reapply to stay at Bethel as a married couple. So you okay. can be there as a single man, and there are a handful of single women, but not very many, uh, or temps. You can be a temporary Bethelite, come and go. Uh, but as a full-time Bethelite, if you get married, you have to put a requisition in your application, and you both have to put your application in, and they look at my credentials and hers to make sure that she is a pioneer and that you're doing everything that you're supposed to do. And uh, typically, if you've been there a while at Bethel and you do everything right, which I thought I did, um, you can get accepted to stay. And they have obviously have to put you in another room, find a, another room for you, and that's your designated place. And um, there were people that had been there less than me that got approved. So it really, it really is hurtful. It was, uh, it was one of the hardest things to not get accepted to Bethel because. I thought I was a shoe in. So we didn't get accepted. I had three or four congregations reach out to me from uh, Kansas, Nebraska, asking me to come to their congregation. Because wow. I guess it's a big deal to, for a Bethelite and a pioneer to come to a small congregation, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I accepted one there in February, Nebraska. I drove back uh, to Nebraska, got married, and we went to the small little town in Fairbury. And we were there. And pioneered. And so, what what is that like financially for you to have to? Because from what I understand, Bethelites are given like a monthly allowance, yeah, like ninety bucks. Ninety bucks. Yep. At that time, kind me. So, like, they don't accept your application, and now you suddenly don't have a place to live. Is that how? They, and then you're just got to figure it out. Trust in Jehovah. Yep, <sighs> and He'll take really? care of you. So. Off we go packing. I had to put everything in my Lahana Civic that I owned, drive across the United States. It took an extra day or two driving back. People wondered where I was. They said I was okay. I was so depressed. I didn't want to go uh, to this new life of the unknown. I didn't know. I was all I had was a high school graduation, like most people. I didn't have any other skills except I was a damn good laundry <laughs> worker. Right. But what's that going to get you in this world? You know, right. Well, that seems like that seems so heartless of the organization for someone that was exemplary like you were mm -hmm. to just, you know, let's suck it up. You're not accepted. Figure it out. No, oh, just trust in Jehovah and go where the, yeah. Wow. So I went back and I didn't know I had any skills. So naturally, I would fall into my, my dad's company, the hearing aids, and he owned a hearing aid business. So my heart wasn't in it, but it was the only option. So I started doing hearing aids and I uh, learned how to uh, test for uh, uh, hearing loss and fit hearing aids. And I started a business center there in Fairbury and a few other neighboring towns and um, started building that business and immediately started pioneering, of course, as you're expected to as an extra Bethelite. Oh, yeah. Um, and, my, and my wife. Uh, I, I did pioneer right away until I got my feet under me, but uh, we definitely brought a lot of life to that congregation. Other people started moving to this little congregation because of us. It was a fun place to be because, you know, we were fun, gregarious, social people. And wherever I went, there was a lot of fun. And that's what I was known for. And, um, of course, all of that fun came to an end a few years later when my life fell apart. Let's talk about it. Let's rip off the Band-Aid. How did your, is this when you finally left the Witnesses? Is this what we're building up to? Yeah. So so what happened? All right. Well, this is pretty sensitive and pretty hard. So I was living life there in Fairbury, trying to contain this gay beast that I keep talking about. Mm -hmm. And it kept trying to come out in little ways. And I would explore a little bit. I found this little, little thing on the internet called gay.com. <laughs> I remember gay dot <laughs> as a witness. Yeah, I mean you never saw it before. It's the best thing ever. Yeah. Um, I was just like, what? So I would secretly go in there and then delete my account or delete. I didn't want any traces following me. So I was able I did hook up with a couple of people in the secret in different places there in the in someone's farm. 
on someone's trailer house <laughs> there in uh, ne Nebraska. But the big cumbia that made at the fireworks come out, one day, leaving, uh, leaving, coming home, going, traveling through Beatrice, Nebraska, I stopped at this park on the outskirts of town and uh, stopped there to have lunch. It's a lovely little park. You know, even these small little rural towns, they had these little parks and these little outdoor restrooms, just a public restroom. So I went there to the restroom and to my surprise and surprise and excitement, there was a little writing on the wall about, you know, you know, call this number for a good time or, you know, be here at this, this hour and you can get a blowjob or something like that. Of course, right away that got my, got my attention <laughs> as someone who's trying to not be gay. Your gay be sees that and he's just clawing out like, you know, let's, let's do that. So I went back to that park again another time because I just thought, well, maybe I'll just be there when someone's there, you know, around that time. And I went back there another time and I went to the bathroom, came out and I saw a, a young man walk by in just regular clothes. And he looked at me and winked at me and kind of motioned for me to come in the bathroom. And I followed him in, of course, you know, as, as my instincts led me and uh, stood next to him in an adjacent uh, urinal and he unzipped and I barely touched his leg, barely reached over to touch him. And before I knew it, he had twirled me around, had me on my knees and cuffed me and had me under arrest and was calling in for backup. He's like, you're under arrest and started reading my me rights. I started bawling, I was terrified. I'd never been in trouble in my life. My whole world fell apart. Everything that I knew, my whole life was just going, flashing before me. He's put me in the back of a cop car. And, and next thing I know, I'm in jail, in a small little jail in Beatrice, Nebraska, not knowing what the hell I'm gonna do. And, uh, I called this one brother that's very discreet and uh, asked him to bail me out. I lied while I was there, of course. I'd never, you know, say what, why, what happened. How embarrassing, right? Right, yeah. And so I, he bailed me out and I went home praying, please, please, please let that be a dream. Please wake up the next morning and all this be gone. Please, 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 Lord, please, please. Oh, you're praying to Jehovah, of course. Please, Jehovah, I will never never abandon you again you know you know the whole story mm -hmm. just you're, you're 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 pleading that all this is going to go away well, the next morning woke up my ex-wife we get a phone call she goes down and picks up the phone and and screams uh the sister had called her evidently there was an excerpt in the paper the newspaper the newspaper about me getting arrested and it's in the newspaper <laughs> yeah and she told, she told Angela, she's like, get, get Sheridan and run. And I had a little boy at that time. He was like six months old. And uh, that's exactly what she did. She grabbed him, ran, she screamed, she was crying. I was crying, I was falling. My, my whole life was falling apart. I didn't know what to do. I, everything was just a blur. Everything happened so fast within an hour or two, an elder came back over with her, accompanying her to get her stuff, all her belongings, all of Sheridan's belongings, and took her away. Took, I mean, she left, and I, I, hadn't, I, didn't, I hadn't seen my son in 20 years. Oh that was the last time. And of course, they brought me before the elders and disfellowshipped me, you know, that next week, oh. right away. What was that conversation like? I, it, it was a blur in my head. I was still, was, you know, you're, you're hard to process everything that's happened. I couldn't go back to work because what I worked with with other witnesses with hearing aids, I was too mortified. I was too embarrassed. I, uh, I couldn't go anywhere in town, small town. I just shut the windows up. I tried to drink myself to death. Mm -hmm. I tried to, I wanted to die. I wanted to kill myself. Uh, I'd been, 
I've been around a shroud of, there's been a shroud of suicide growing up my entire life. When I was 15, one of my best friends killed himself uh, in the church, and the really, his dad was an elder. And I, they asked me to be a pallbearer at his funeral. It was the hardest thing. And looking back now, what I know, I, he's probably sure he was gay and a small town in Kansas and killed himself. And then years later, an elder that lived next door to himself killed himself. And then uh, my uncle, he killed himself as well. Uh, he, was, he was actually an elder uh, there as well in Kansas. So I, I didn't want to be another statistic. Yeah. And I didn't want to. I, I thought about it. You, when you're in that much pain and that much, that much heartache, you just want it all to go away. And the easiest way out, you think at the time, is suicide. But not and that's it's one of the reasons i'm speaking out now today is to tell others out there to tell people that no matter how hard it gets or how low you go or how many lemons life gives you or how much shit it gives you it's not the end there's yeah. there's life after witnesses there's life after all of that you know, there's there's happiness somehow you just can't give up there it is yeah i don't yeah. want to like give you a hug right now i feel so terrible that's horrible what a story some of this is probably like really foreign to a lot of people the whole concept of you just because it sounds like you just touched this guy's leg yeah yeah it was um this was in the early 2000s mm -hmm. late 90s um no it was late 90s it was probably uh 90 mid mid to late 90s was probably uh yeah 98 or something like that 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 happened so i basically walked into a police sting and i didn't know I, I didn't have the forethought or knowledge to plead not guilty someone told me to plead no contest and so i saw yeah. so that's what i did i didn't know what to do so, so this I, was in ne nebraska is it like is being was being gay just like illegal there at the time or was it like what what was it specifically that he stung you for it just lewd conduct and i can't remember all the charges uh they had named off a bunch of them i was because in my mind was a blur oh and, just a blur well i'm glad yeah. you're telling all this because i feel like a lot of the mm -hmm. more recent generation of gay people at easily forget how bad it was for us not that long ago this wasn't that long ago no um, no it wasn't it wasn't yeah note from the editing room i just want to clarify here for anyone unfamiliar with the culture at the time but gay people do not as a general rule go to bathrooms and sexually harass people that's not what happened here at a time before dating apps or grinder or you know wide acceptance of gay people in general uh, there used to be spots where gay people would go to meet one another and the police would hang out at these spots posing as a gay man and they would give off all of the signals implying to the person that they're about to engage in something consensual. They basically baited and entrapped people as a regular practice. The Los Angeles Times did a great article about this that Sean wanted me to share. This is something that he wanted to talk a little bit more about in our conversation, but it was a very emotional conversation, so it slipped his mind. So there's that note. If you'd like to read the article, I've put a link to it in the description below. And then the last time I... Uh saw my family because about six months later my dad died <gasps> and uh i still remember him calling leaving a message telling me please call call me you can still come back to jehovah and uh he was uh suffering with cancer lymphoma at the time and he'd been fighting it for years and then uh about six months later after my disfellowshipping he he passed away. I was able to go out there and, and see him right before he died. It was really hard because no one would talk to me, my family, and look at me. You know, you're looked at like you're the devil. You know, yeah. they don't even look in your, my brothers, wouldn't even look in my direction. So um, I was told when the funeral was. So I drive out by myself and you're on your own island. When you're kicked out and you're just fellowship, you're on your own. There's, you go, I went from hundreds of friends, hundreds. I mean, I knew. A lot of people. I was very gregarious, very social. I went for having a lot of friends, and many of those friends I look back on and miss 
to this day. I, I had some really fun times with them, but all of those are gone in a snap when uh, something like that happens, especially as embarrassing as what happened to me. It was like one of the most embarrassing things that I can even imagine. So I went to my dad's funeral. I drive, it wasn't at a kingdom hall, you'd think, because of my dad's influence on how many people yeah. you know? It was at City Hall. It was that freaking oh. this huge building they had to, to, to house that many people. So I pull up all these cars, and uh, they usher me in the back quietly, you know, and have me sitting on the back until I get started, you know, because I am a leper. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, it, as, as soon as it started, my dad's service, they sat me right in front next to my family. All my family is in the front. They sat right next to my grandma, and, you know, she wouldn't even look at me, you know, none of my brothers. Uh, well, one of them um, acknowledged me, but my grandma wouldn't even look my direction. And so I just look at my dad's picture right in front of me at the casket. And I can barely remember what the service was. I wanted to go see, say hi to my um, my son. I knew he was in the back somewhere with, with my wife. And they wouldn't let me, they would not allow me to see my ex-wife or see, see Sheridan at all. And I was ushered out. And I left and cried and cried and cried and cried. I just drove and drove and drove. And I didn't want to, I didn't know what to do. That was the last time I saw my family. Wow. And it was the last time I had any contact with uh, my son until just a couple of years ago. Wow. So now we're in a period between you know, then and now almost 20 years now, what was your life post all of this up until, you know, the last few months or, or a year when you reunite with your son? Uh, did it get better? Yeah. You know, was so I moved to Seattle and got a job here. Of course, when Craig met me, um, just real quick, when he met me there in Omaha, I was living on someone's couch. I was working three jobs, trying to just make ends meet. We got, we finally moved in together with an apartment with someone else. It was hard. It was hard. I was working nonstop, doing what I could to just try to stay sane, try to take care of myself. I was decided to go to the, instead of drinking all the time, I tried to drink myself to death. I stopped doing that for a while and just going to the gym, taking care of myself. And that was better, trying to be more productive with the way I deal with this. And because the alcohol doesn't make, problems any better it makes it worse it makes your depression worse because it's a depressant mm -hmm. so that's when craig met me we moved in together and then we moved to seattle about 20 years ago and uh, i remember when i moved here to seattle we uh one of my first customers i i, I worked at a fireplace store here and it was a retail store one of my first customers i was talking to her and she was showing me pictures of her cat and her, her stove. And I talked about my cat and my roommate, how me and my roommate do this. And me and my roommate do this. And she finally, she grabbed my hand. She goes, honey, she goes, it's your boyfriend, right? And I go, yeah. She goes, you're not in Nebraska anymore. You're in Seattle. We don't fucking care in Seattle. Because <laughs> I started crying. I had never met anyone that had no concept like that. And it's true. It's, uh, it's, and it's and not just here, but there's other places in the, in the world where I think we're getting there where people finally realize that this is not, you know, this is a way of life. This is something that we can't control, mm -hmm. which is, uh, and being gay is completely evident by your genes, which is hundred percent evident with, my experiment, my very painful experiment, and my son. <laughs> so how is that gay beast now? I mean, when, it, during this whole period, did the gay beast, is he still going crazy? Or are you still oh. like, scrapping at the walls for... Oh. You know? oh, no, he came out, he came out and just tore people apart when <laughs> I, and myself, back in Nebraska. And I tried going back to the Kingdom Hall, by the way, for a little bit. I really thought I would try. I went back, I sat in the back of the the congregation. I I went in when it started, left. I cried constantly. People there were some people that were in that congregation that are now out of the religion that contact me and said that they're out 
because of the way they saw I was treated and how horrible it was. And um, it was just, it was very, very sad that they could just turn their back. You know, they don't offer any support. You know, the witnesses offer no moral or therapy or any type of support whatsoever. All they say is pray, um, mm -hmm. be more diligent, uh, go to more meetings, pioneer more. That's their answer to everything. That's not how life works. It's not going to be the answer to mental illness or to being um, how you want to be or just coping with life. Yeah. You know, and so I, uh, that gay beast is now gone. He's yeah. now out. He's trimmed his claws. He's, uh, he, 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 I take him on walks outside. He, uh, he's, he's docile. He, <laughs> he's like anybody else, um, uh, straight or gay, no matter who you are. Um, we all are treated with the same respect and love as I think that type of love that, you know, Jesus talked about in the Bible. And uh, that's where the witnesses, I think, don't understand, you know, what that, what that means to have that unconditional love and really treat your neighbor you know, as yourself, no matter who that neighbor is. And it's taken me a long time to get to that point and reconcile my faith and, and my gay side and realize that you can have both. You can't have one or the other. It's the witnesses that put it in your head that you can't. It's them saying that you have to be this way. You have to, uh, you have to really toe the line in this one way of thinking, or you're out. You're either in or out. That's it. Exactly. And it's, it's just amazing how much, like once you accept who you are and accept yourself and just let you, you be yourself, how little all of that stuff matters the way that it did when you were trying not to be yourself. Mm -hmm. so yep. that now that's probably the least interesting side of you. You've yeah. got a whole yeah, life. Exactly. I'm gay. So what? And so uh, yeah, I am just like another person. That person is straight. They have blonde hair. They have um, brown hair, um, blue eyes, brown eyes. It doesn't matter. And um, like I, I mentioned um, my son briefly. But do uh, you want me to talk about that a little bit? About, uh, yeah, so let, let's get there because this story is not over, folks. This is about to get wild. This is the climax here. So go, at, go ahead and bring us, bring us to speed. I am living my happy life here in Seattle. And I'm not really, remember this story I put in Pandora's box and I haven't looked at it. I don't look in it at all. It's not until recently that my partner, who's been with me for 20 years, even has realized some of the stuff that goes on with the Jehovah's Witnesses. He's known, he's been with me all this entire time. Not until these last few months, Jeremy, have we been watching YouTube together and he's sitting beside me and I'll tell him, I was like, oh, we'll turn to something else. We, you're probably getting tired of this extra Jehovah's Witness stuff. He goes, no, I'm fascinated. I had no idea <laughs> that this cult that you were in was so crazy. I had no clue that that it was like this. So there you go. I someone that I've been with for 20 years. I didn't talk about it with him. I, he knew some, but not to this degree. Not to the degree of the shunning and 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 the hypocrisy and the lies and the, and the way they really keep their flock um, uneducated to make their own decisions. So, anyways, I am here in Seattle going to work one day at work and I get this message from my ex-wife. You need to contact me right now. It's about Sheridan, your son. It's an emergency. Of course, right away, I'm just hyperventilating. She hasn't reached out to me in 20 years. Yeah, you haven't talked to either of them. You haven't seen your, have you even seen your son, what he looks like? I, I, I did get a picture from someone, but that's it. No idea. And um, and in the back of my mind, I've always said, and I've said this to other people before, that if, if I were to have pushed the envelope and see him, because they wouldn't allow me to see him whatsoever, in no unconditional terms. And I and she if I would have tried to see him, she would have ran. She would have gone somewhere and, and, and made it impossible. Uh, she made that clear with me and her friends. There's no doubt that there's no way she would let Sean see him 
So in the back of my mind, I always said, if I were to even see him for one day, I would knock on the door and say, hey, I'm your dad. And he turned out gay. They would blame it all on me. A hundred percent. My fault. So here we are, 20 years later. I get this message from my wife. I call her. And they're going to kick him out of the house because they found out he's gay. And I need to get on the plane, the next plane to Kansas City, and I need to take over now. She said, I did the first 20. I said, you got the next 20. Oh, my God. I so can't imagine the way you must have felt after that phone call. Oh, my God. It was... <sighs> It was, it was my employee. So I called Craig right away. I said, we need to get to Kansas City now. I told my boss right away, of course, you know, they're like, yes, of course, go, go. Of course, she thinks I'm going to get there right when he gets off of school. Because he doesn't know this is coming yet. He's at school. They find some evidence where the, uh, that he's gay and there she's going to pick him up from school and drop him off at the hotel of my choosing and be done with him. Goodbye. This 19 year old kid. Oh my gosh. Or 20, 20 year old kid at the time. And um, so getting a plane from Seattle to Kansas City, it's not gonna happen in a few hours. So I couldn't get there till like 10, 30, 11 at night. So immediately we're getting on the plane and be notes to everybody at this time. I was going through some pretty serious heart situation. Um, in 2010, I had cardiac arrest, and uh, and I, I woke up like seven days later there at Harborview, put me down in a coma, very hard, and I just about didn't make it. And I've um, had some brand. No one knows. I've had many cardiologists, many doctors look at. No one knows to this day really what and why. My heart decides to, it's when it stops. It has the extra beats, these elect electronic things that, that that start to make my heart quiver and go into a, a bad pace and then start to shut down. Like a computer starts to go crazy and shuts down and just crashes. That's what my heart does. So I was having a lot more instances that year. And I was told by my doctor to get off my medicine. I'm going in for an ablation that coming... Wednesday it was my third ablation to try to go and find these cells and burn them off. So I had to remain calm all week. I couldn't get my heart rate up. And I stay home because my next my procedure is coming up Wednesday. Wednesday, she calls me on Thursday. I have to get there. As as a dad who hasn't seen their son, you have to do what you have to do. And I couldn't tell my doctor. He would have said, "No, you can't get on a plane." <laughs> There's right. no way in hell. And we we fly there. I'm praying, please keep my heart rate down. Please keep it down. I'm trying to be as calm as possible. On my way there to the airport, my wife calls me. You need to you need to talk to your son right now. We're going down the freeway at 50 miles an hour, and he's gonna jump out of the car and kill himself. And so here I am. This is okay, my first. This is my first time talking to my son. Oh my gosh. So I have the phone. I say, she puts my me on speakerphone. I was like, Sheridan? He's like, yeah. He's like, this is your dad. Please don't trip out of the car. Promise. She goes, okay. And she was like, he's not telling me the truth. He's not telling me where he was and, and, and what happened here. And she's trying to drill him, of course. I was like, Sheridan? Sheridan. You don't need to answer anyone. You don't need to answer to me, to your mom. All we want is for you to be safe, Sheridan. That's all we want. I am flying to Kansas City tonight. We're going to be at this hotel. I had to put my name because she said if it was in her name, her, her the stepfather would find him and kill him and, uh, and, and track the credit card. So she had to get him out of the house. And make sure it's in my name so it couldn't be tracked. Isn't that insane? Isn't that crazy? Is he yeah. a witness? Yes. Yes, he is. Yeah. And so I said, Sheridan, can you please hold it together? Please don't jump out of the car until I get there. And she goes, okay, I won't. 
So we fly into Kansas City. I get there. I pull up to the hotel. Me and Craig are going in and expecting a nice, peaceful transition of power, so to speak, a nice handoff. And she'd be there, you know, talk to us, knock on the door. He opens. She's nowhere to be found. She's gone. She's left him and all his belongings are there. Just abandoned. Yeah. So there I am face to face with my own son for the first time, 20 years. So I shook my, she took up my hand and said, hi, I'm your dad. This is my husband, Craig, put our bags down. Let's go get something to eat. Let's go have a chat. So we went to the only place that was open at that time at 11, 30, 12 at night there in Kansas city, which is a waffle house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we went to the Waffle House and uh, sat there, and I was like, okay, Sheridan, you probably have a lot of questions. You're probably mad. You probably want to know what's going on. And he'd been uh, going to school for acting. To my surprise, she had let him go to a college for acting. You're not supposed to let your kids go to college, witness. But she let him do that, which was actually a saving grace in all of this because he had some friends outside of the witnesses, thankfully. But uh, he put his acting face on. He goes, it's good. Everything's fine. It's okay. He's like, no, sure. It's not fine. Uh, needless to say, I, it's going to take a while to unpack all those feelings the first day, the first, the first yeah. meeting. You don't, you don't unpack all that when you see your dad for the first time in 20 years. So understandably, he was very reserved. And it was a hard conversation. We talked for a while. And, She's like, okay, well, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll get this taken care of. And um, so we had three days to find him an apartment. Me and Craig had to find him an apartment there. Getting an apartment in three days is hard. Yeah. <laughs> no <laughs> kidding. So we had three days to get him, my, my kid, an apartment. And uh, we didn't know what to do. We don't, have, we don't have a lot of money. Craig started a GoFundMe page. Brilliant. I don't know how he thought of it, but he posted a picture of all his belongings there in the ho hotel and said, family kicks their son out for being gay and he's going to be homeless. Can you please help us? And within hours, people were donating hundreds of dollars, $500 there, $500 there, a thousand. We had within a few days, $5,000. People that I didn't even know oh, donating. So and all worldly people. Yeah. Worldly people doing this. Yeah. All worldly people. And they donated for me to be able to get an apartment to prepay for six months for him, at least just to start out with, to get him somewhere on his feet. And uh, so that's, and that's, that's how I met my son the first time. So it's a very, heartbreaking very painful experience that that goes to show you that being gay is isn't something that you choose who would choose all of that who would right. choose right. who would choose the heartache of of going through that being arrested and no one would choose that and being and with your family when someone no. said that no. that you made this choice no no, and then your son, years later, that you've had no influence. No one can say it influenced him, except through DNA. That he's gay too. How, how can you deny that? Even the naysayers, even people who don't believe in science or don't believe in, I don't know what they believe in. Mm -hmm. You can't deny that. No. It's just, and we're finding out more and more people that have family members that are gay, brothers, sisters um aunts uncles it's, it's it's something that runs in families it's something that runs in our dna that we can't control so uh we're we're, we're still work, we're working on our relationship now uh, we uh, we uh, we have a therapy session that we go to therapy uh, online with someone that's helping oh, that's so good and so it's trying to trying to draw us closer together trying to um, build building blocks of a relationship and um, try to try to try to work on it one day at a time, as as best we can, and you know all we all we can do. 
it's i mean this has got to be a wild experience for him too because he i mean he just got kicked out and he's meeting his dad for the first time who's also yeah. gay he's also losing his religion you know he's going through all of this so how is he coping how is he doing with all of like losing the religion and is he being shunned really hard it sounds like he had friends at least he had a support network yeah thankfully he has friends from the school that they let him go to Thankfully, his mom allowed him to go to outside school beyond high school. She saw that he had a love of, uh, of, uh, of theater, and so she let him embrace that, which is great. And uh, through that, he met worldly friends, and those are some of his friends that he has today. And, and uh, of course, he is shunned by all his back family, all his family and friends from the witnesses they're gone just like it was for me just like my whole life is just you know i'm dead to them i'm 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 worse than the devil to them yeah, just from everything at the, drop of the hat, at the drop of the hat suddenly i mean this is just yes. so, so crazy to me that you know this kid that they've kept away from you for all of these years now suddenly completely abandoned completely abandoned oh. call you up to come you know, he's your problem now. Like, 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 you know, he's a human being. He's not anybody's problem. Yep. You know? yeah. Oh, yeah. I feel for you both. I really do. <laughs> but, but it's just come full circle. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've had tremendous support from my husband, Craig. He's been there for me nonstop as well as his family and, and friends here that we've met. I've met true friends that, are here for us at a drop of a hat, you know. Good. You know, when I had my cardiac arrest, you know, I had friends there, you know, next to us that were there um, to support us, you know. Um, you know, I, I my, 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 my husband, I guess, tried calling my mom just to check up on me, but um, she called once to see that I was okay, but that's it, you know. And so it's a it's stark difference of, the, what they call love and the religion to what true friends are supposed to be mm -hmm. and, and be there for you thick, thick and thin we all fall every one of us is fallible none of us are perfect you know except for the governing body or that's what they think <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah. no that's not true that everyone is imperfect and yes. and if i can do anything I just want to make sure that this gets out there and I help others that are struggling and and they're if they're at the end of the rope like I was I felt like I was at the end of the rope I when I was in Fairbury Nebraska all of my world was crashing in on me I had a friend that was one of my best friends and his wife was Angela's friends that we have a we have a baby's the same age they're within a couple months so we were really close to them. I get this knock on the door after after the came out in the newspaper, and I'm just disfellowship, and I'm I'm at home crying all the time. And I get this knock on the door, and I run to the door, and I see him jump in the car. And he gives me a scowl and takes off. And there's this package there of something. I took it inside this envelope, and I took it inside. And it's a picture of all of us: me, my son, his daughter. All ripped in half. No. Just all ripped in half. Like, we're done. This is it. We're, and we're, they gave that to you? Yeah, yeah. My doorstep. Yeah. So he was rude. One of my best friends. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, uh, so why would I want to go to the back to the congregation? I mean, right. why, would, why would you want to go back and be around? You know, they say they want you to repent and they'll accept you with open arms, the prodigal son, all that bullshit. Mm -hmm. But if that's hard, it's really hard to go back. And once I was out, I realized, what do I have to lose? My, I might as well explore this mm -hmm. gay side of my life. That's where I started to explore. And that's where I met, met Craig. I met, I met him at a club. Uh, he was uh, just coming off of a... Uh, a, a kind of a medical disaster in his life and uh, 
we he was there for a reason. It was I think things are meant to be. Mm -hmm. I think things aren't always what the witnesses think it's going to be, but I think there's a plan for everything and there's a plan for all of us. And yeah. we may not know what the plan is. And we may not even believe that there's a plan. There's non-believers out there as well as believers. And, but that's okay. It's as long as we keep moving forward. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like Craig has been instrumental in just, you, you know, your entire life, his love for you is completely unconditional, you know, and it's not, I mean, it doesn't sound like once you got out of the religion and stopped trying to suppress things, you're defying all of these stereotypes that they have about gay people. You know, you're not, you know, you're not sleeping around anymore. Like you have a husband that you've been with all of this time. Mm -hmm. and he's, you know, set up this great GoFundMe for your son that he's never met either. That's not his son. And, you know, he's there for you through all of it. It's just breaking all of these stereotypes. And it's, I'm really proud of you for how far you've come and how much, and for speaking out and, you know, everything that you've accomplished in your life. It's incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot to unpack and I'm sure there's some details in that story that I didn't, that, that I missed somewhere in all of that. But yeah, from the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows. Yeah. I've, I've seen some of these uh, interviews of like other Bethelites. Well, that's one of the reasons I want to get on and give a perspective of Bethelite that actually loved Bethel. <laughs> yeah. I hear, I hear so many people dogging it. It's so hard, yeah. like the military. Maybe I'm not normal. I know because of my dad, <laughs> I know I'm not normal. Uh -huh. so I, I grew up kind of a materialistic type of thinking and, and I loved it. And, um, but at the same time, you can't be gay. I mean, if you could, if you could be gay and be at Bethel, I would still be there, but right. <laughs> right. wouldn't we all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, if the religion were perfect, I'd still be there. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know. <laughs> no, no. So that that's, it's been a long journey but I, I i was gonna say i wouldn't do it again but i stopped myself because there's some things i wouldn't do because you don't no one wants to go through all that pain and that heartache so there are things that you want to go back and redo and maybe do it differently but you wouldn't be where you're at now if you did exactly well if you were to, if you were presented with a person that's like the carbon copy of you now in their 20s and they're about you know they're hiding their sexuality and maybe they're going to go you know go to Bethel and try to do it Jehovah's Witnesses way and try to just you just not do it and marry and you know what would your advice to that person be that's in that fork in the road in their youth stop really Think about what you're doing. Talk to somebody else besides a Jehovah's Witness. Talk to someone of your friends. You can, uh, talking to someone in the witnesses, they always say talking to the elders and Mr. Servants, they're biased, mm -hmm. unfortunately, unfortunately. They only have one way of thinking. They're biased. I used to be part of that. And uh, they would tell you to keep everything within the religion. But you need to look outside, stop, look at, look at, uh, Look at the platforms like yours that you have, uh, mentally diseased, and other platforms on on YouTube. It's very helpful to help to see that there's others out there that you can talk to. You can reach out to uh, other people. You can reach out to me. You can reach out to you. There's there's you know, people like us that are willing now to pick them up and, and help them through um, how they're feeling. But don't just rush into getting married thinking that's going to go all the way. And I, I, I'm going to, it's going to, it's going to uh, cure the gay. Uh, if I get married, then I won't be gay anymore. It's not how it works, honey. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I tried that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can try really hard to suppress that gay beast. It'll come out eventually. And it's so much worse. It's, it's so much worse that way. Than if you just it accept is, it. It is. It is going to come out in ways where it's going to just destroy everything. Those bars are going to come loose, or it's going to come out in a way that you don't want it to come out. So at least come out now and you can control the way it comes out. You can control yes. the narrative instead of be a victim of the narrative. Yeah. Absolutely. I have one last question. Sure. Um, 
is so has your son fallen down the XJW rabbit hole yet? Or is he not I, ready for all that? I think he's not quite ready either yet. A little bit. He's going to definitely, um, I talked told about you. I'm going to, um, you know, give him this link and, um, uh, I think he, he'll get there. Um, he's, he's definitely not going back. He's definitely out. He's uh, hoping to move to Seattle here someday, which would be nice so that we can be closer to him and that we can, um, develop a relationship a little more and I can be more, a little more supportive if he's closer. And plus, frankly, he'd love it here <laughs> and a little more accepting here in Seattle than it is in Kansas. Oh yeah. <laughs> and Seattle's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I love it here. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Sean, thank you so much for thank you. Share, share your story with me today. I think it's so powerful and hopefully it can help others facing a similar, you know, fork in the road in their youth. Thank you so much. If there's anyone um, watching this, is there anywhere that people can find you to kind of follow your journey from here on out, maybe a Twitter account or someplace to follow you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I do have a Twitter. I was uh, uh, just going to uh, pull that up here um, to double check my Twitter. It's, uh, it's at, it's Sean, it's Sean Smith at Sean's Journey, J-O-U-R-N-I-E. Okay, all right. Thank you once again, everyone watching this. Please do give him a follow, show him your support with a comment down below. I'm sure he'll be watching the comments. And if you're in the jerk in the comments, I'm gonna get rid of you, so don't be a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, yes, I really appreciate it. If you like this video, you wanna see more like it, please do give it a like, subscribe, all that obligatory stuff. And uh, thanks for watching. Take care, everybody.